Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I, there's certain, I think there's certain facts that are, they're not worth getting. Yeah. Um, well, and, well, you're saying they're not worth getting, but you're not saying people can't go be free to go ahead and do no, it. You're just saying no. it would be a, a fruitless effort or, you know, wouldn't have much philosophical worth or something like that. Yeah, but and also it could be uh, socially harmful to make much of those facts. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, so, uh, again, if there's a gene for materialism, you know, just, you know, acquisitiveness, right? Um, it, and some scientist says, listen, what I want to spend a million dollars on is to figure out if Jews have this gene more than, than the goyim, yeah. right? Well, it's skip okay. me yeah, okay. if it exists. But so like, it's like, so is there, yeah. is there a, a gene for Jewish, you know, hoarding, right? Yeah. Like, is that the scientific paper you want to try to write? Right. Um, you would have to question the social motives of somebody who mm -hmm. would do that. And obviously there's, you know, analogous things you would do in the black community or in any other community. Yeah. Um, and so I think it would, be very, it would be very easy to stigmatize that research and, and there's a, maybe a reason to avoid it because it's just, there's nothing you're gonna do with the information that is at all socially positive. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's, it's not a possible thesis. Right. And, and so if someone said, listen, I've, uh, you know, I've genotyped, you know, 400,000 Jewish people, and um, it turns out we, you know, we have this gene for acquisitiveness, and it's it's shown it's kind of upregulated in among hoarders and and um, people who, you know, are, become very wealthy but won't spend any of their money. They like famous misers. We've done mm -hmm. all this, and right. it turns out, you know, Ashkenazi Jews have this much more than other people. Uh, let's talk about it. That person's career would be destroyed right. for his bigotry, but that would be. It's a, it's a totally rational thing we could talk about, and as a Jew, I wouldn't be the least offended by the the entertaining that fact, and I'd be interested in the science. And right. I just think it's probably, so. That didn't make you a Jewophobe just by saying that, because I, I can well, see the memes flying. Right but you now. can but but you can imagine some of the, the 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 prurient interest that people would have in that kind of research. It would attract you right. know, people who who were interested in it for the wrong reasons. I mean, you know, so every anti-Semite in the world would want to, you know, to want that to be true, right? Yeah. Um, and it's same, so it is with, intel, you know, IQ differences among blacks and whites and Asians. And I mean, that's, you know, all that research is so heavily stigmatized. Um, and one wonders what's the point of, of doing it? Because you know, well, what are you going to do differently as a result mm -hmm. of, of getting, getting those data? But um, it doesn't mean that it's synonymous with uh, bigotry to actually understand the you know, genetic differences there. And that's, right. um... Are different performances on standardized tests a sign of difference in intelligence? Are differences in intelligence then rooted in genetic factors? If genetics is determinant of one's intelligence, would this be why there's a difference in IQ between so-called races? And most importantly, are these racial differences in IQ an undeniable biological fact and immune to social or technological efforts of changing them? None of these questions are new, mind you. Charles Murray and Richard J. Herrnstein tried answering these questions in the bell curve, which led to confrontations in politics and in academia over topics such as institutional and societal racism, freedom of academics, and limits of meritocracy, the ethics of research, the validity of the IQ test, and social policy. The bell curve has been and is still being pushed as some kind of major revolutionary work, a book with undisputed data and statistics that can be and only be explained by inherent racial differences. Thing is though, it's honestly a pathetic book with no real relevance to the questions it actually purported to answer at all. That's not just some opinion of mine, mind you, it's just an observable fact. I doubt many of the people pushing it in heated arguments online have actually bothered to read even a single page of it, let alone a chapter. It is a book with a veneer of credibility, and it does contain plenty of citations for genuine statistical facts between so-called races. However, it's not the smoking gun it was and is still hyped to be. Reason being, it is, and only is, a glorified collection of sociological papers. Its ideas and proclamations are merely rehashed constructs from psychologists, psychometricians, and anthropologists originating in the 19th century. Constructs such as the general factor of intelligence from Charles Spearman, 
to Louis Tierman's invention of the standard Binet IQ test and hereditary interpretations of its results, to a hierarchical taxonomy of races by Carlton Kuhn. Nothing and only nothing purported by the bell curve is anything new or even from the modern era of scientific research. Not even any of the sources of data are from biological fields. It's all just sociology, and the only citation from the biological fields are from before modern scientific models existed in those biological fields. Hence, the book literally cannot be argued to be based on any sound biological basis. So why is the book taken seriously by Sam Harris, a man with a background in neurology? In this video, I will take on the bell curve, as well as Sam Harris, and his decline into sheer dishonesty, promoting what it claims. The bell curve, written by Murray and Herrnstein, cites studies that received funding and research from the Pioneer Fund. And that alone is a red flag. Let me tell you why. The Pioneer Fund was founded on March 11th in 1937. One of the founders was Wycliffe Preston Draper, who was an heir to a great fortune and was the movement's strong man from 1937 to 1972. He founded the Pioneer Fund after gaining an interest in the 30th century active racial hygiene movement. In 1935, Draper visited Nazi Germany to meet leading eugenicists. The Pioneer Fund itself describes him as an intellectual philanthropist. Draper also financed advocates of repatriation of black people to Africa. Yes, literally sending black Americans back to Africa. And he was an opponent of civil rights laws for blacks. In addition, he made major contributions to the opposition to the U.S. civil rights movement and the desegregation decisions decided by the Supreme Court such as $215,000 in 1963 to the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission, which was a state-owned organization engaged in information and propaganda campaigns to counter desegregation. One of the founders of the organization, Frederick Osborne, called the Nazi racial hygiene philosophy the most important experiment ever tested. The majority of the foundation's grants go to academic research for researchers at almost 40 different universities, and smaller sums have been donated to political or legal organizations mainly aimed at limiting immigration. Many of the researchers whose work supports the hereditary hypothesis in terms of racial and intelligence has received money from the Pioneer Fund. The foundation also donates money to other research deemed to be in line with its purposes. Larger sums, in descending order, have been donated to Thomas J. Bouchard at the University of Minnesota. Bouchard received $2.3 million for his twin study, the Minnesota study of identical twins reared apart, more famous as the Minnesota Twins Project. The project compared twins that had grown up in different families. However, this study is highly flawed, as I demonstrated in a previous IQ video. I'm going to talk about a fairly well-known study that is a very good example of how scientific endeavor can go very wrong if you have a clear bias from the beginning. It's called the Minnesota Study of Twins Reared Apart. This study claimed that monozygotic pairs share no environmental similarities in the studies. The MZA interclass correlation of 0.5 for a personality trait directly estimates the heritability of the trait because MZA twins share only their genes. Now these calculations are essentially mean correlations in a sample of pairs, and sometimes they also studied reared apart dizygotic pairs. They focused mainly on IQ and personality. Before the publications of the Minnesota studies, Three other TRA studies claiming complete separation were published and included detailed case history information. To make things very complicated for those who have brought forth these studies, including the Minnesota study, to argue in favor of the heritability of IQ, in all of these studies, many of the twin pairs experienced very late separation, and many pairs were reared together in the same home for several years. Most of the twin pairs grew up in very similar socioeconomic and cultural environments as well. And this is something that I see these people ignoring when pushing these studies. 
Also, in studies based on volunteer twins, there is a very obvious bias that has been introduced into the actual study that one has to be honest about. Since these pairs had to be aware of each other's existence to be able to participate in the study, and in many of these volunteer twin cases, their stories cannot be corroborated. Another important thing to mention about all of these studies is monozygotic samples were very much biased in favor of more similar pairs. What this means is that the studied monozygotic pairs are not at all representative of the monozygotics as a population. Trust me, there's plenty more that's wrong with Bouchard's research. Click the link in the description to see the video and find out. Moving on. Arthur Jensen at the Institute for the Study of Educational Differences and J. Philip Rushton of the University of Western Ontario have also received funding, and Rushton was the chairman of the foundation since 2002. I picked apart the flawed science of Rushton and Jensen in my last video. One of the most cited papers by genetic determinists is a 13-year-old paper by Arthur Jensen and J. Philip Rushton. In the paper, they classify human beings as, I quote, Negroids, Caucasoids, and Mongoloids. No, really, they actually do that. Yes, a paper only somewhat older than a decade claims human variation can be classified into no more than three human races. Again, to see the video, click the link in the description. Roger Pearson at the University for the Study of Man also received funding. He's a proponent of eugenics and is the founder of the Journal of Indo-European Studies and received over $1 million in scholarships in the 80s and 90s. Pearson was, under pseudonym, editor of The New Patriot, a short-lived magazine that existed in 1966-67 to to carry out a responsible but penetrating inquiry into every aspect of the Jewish question. I really wish I was making that up, but I'm not. Richard Lynn at Ulster Institute for Social Research and Humanity Quarterly also received funding. He is a British professor in psychology at the University of Ulster and known for his controversial view of group differences in human beings, ethnic groups and IQ differences between world countries. He believes that research has to rethink about racial hygiene, which he believes had an undeserved bad reputation for the Nazis' attempt to breed a ruler. Lin believes there are hereditary differences in intelligence based on race and gender. Lin's research is controversial. He also made it into the editorial board for the magazines Intelligence and Personality and Individual Differences. He also got into the board of the Pioneer Fund. Richard Lin has advocated that those he believes are weak and sick should be classified as weak specimens whose survival should not be encouraged. Do I need to go on? The fact that the bell curve cites studies, performed not just by clearly biased researchers, but whom also are funded by a clearly biased think tank, alone is reason to question the validity of the book. And with all these facts, Sam Harris, a man once declared one of the greatest modern thinkers and champion of the truth, honestly promotes the book and even softballs the writers in interviews. There's this w one piece which is IQ itself, having nothing to do with race, has been a somewhat taboo topic, particularly on the left, politically. But what's interesting is that it wasn't always the case, because the left used to be kind of boosterish about IQ testing because it seemed to promise a direct road to meritocracy. It would get us yeah. out of cl these class differences, and people could just be judged on their own merits. That's why the SAT was invented. The SAT was uh, was going to be, and in fact, it did serve this function. It would be a way for kids who did not go to Groton and uh, Exeter and the rest of it to to uh, get a chance to show how smart they were, and they could be brought into the colleges and Harvard in particular. And its Conant, its president, back in the 1940s, were very hot on using tests for precisely that purpose. And by the way, uh, I went to Harvard in 1961, which pretty well dates me, uh, fr from Newton, Iowa. And uh, I was absolutely convinced that I got in because I was able to take an SAT score and get a good score, even though I went to a mediocre public school. Sorry about that, Newton High School. Uh, and, and in that sense, 
the enthusiasm for IQ is appropriate insofar as it's a good way to identify intellectual talent. But at this point, Sam, it's almost as if we are in the opposite position of conventional wisdom versus elite wisdom that we were, say, when Columbus was going to sail to America. When, when Columbus was going to sail to America, it is true that an awful lot of the ordinary people still thought that the earth was flat. But among the elites, it was understood that the earth is round. Well, now it is ordinary people are perfectly comfortable with the idea that some people are smarter than others. They're perfectly comfortable that that, that, that what we call smart uh, gets you kinds of jobs that you can't get otherwise, all that kind of stuff. Mm. It's the elites who are under the impression that, oh, IQ tests only measure what IQ tests measure, and nobody really is able to define intelligence. And this and that, they're, they're culturally biased, on and on and on and on. And all of these things are the equivalent of saying the earth is flat. These are not opinions that you can hold in, in contest with the scientific literature any more than you can be an Aristotelian physicist uh, in contradistinction to a Newtonian physicist. This stuff is not subject to debate anymore. Yeah. But the, the elite wisdom now in colleges is, and a lot of your listeners are saying that what I'm saying is pseudoscience. It's very frustrating. Yeah, you just referenced two things which I think are widely believed, which are certainly known to be false and, and were known to be false at the time you wrote your book, again, more than 20 years ago. And the, the first claim is that IQ tests simply measure people's ability to take IQ tests. Yeah. That is a shibboleth that is, is rattling around the brains of certainly many of our listeners. No one in touch with the literature has thought that was true for a generation. And then there's the idea that these tests are well known to be culturally biased so that you just cannot get valid data on certain groups. And, and, and this is something we've never been able to overcome. That also is not the current opinion of psychometricians anywhere. Is that is that correct? Yeah. And, and let's let me describe a little bit why we know those two things uh, in terms of why we know that IQ tests measure something other than the ability to take IQ tests, it's a matter of predictive validity. And predictive validity means that if you take a population with who have IQ scores and then you take a uh, their, their history on a variety of things of interest such as income or job productivity or the rest of it, the IQ scores predict this outcome. So they predict income. In terms of employment decisions for job productivity, you are better off if you're an employer and you have only one datum that you can get. You can't, you can't have two. You are better off knowing an IQ score than you are having a personal interview, having grades, having degrees or anything else. The, the single most informative thing you can have is an IQ score. This is not the result of a one or two studies. The, the predictive validity of IQ tests has been established over and over. You might think this was a coffee break rather than an actual discussion. Now let me move on to responding to Sam Harris and the statements he's made ever since he started promoting this nonsense. To, to describe what happened here, but so I had Charles Murray on my podcast a year ago, and Charles Murray is this, this um, social scientist who uh, published The Bell Curve back in the 90s, which it was a, a book about IQ and and success in, in Western societies. Like uh, He wrote this book, it had a, a chapter on race, which talked about the disparities in, in, in r racial uh, groups. Uh, the it, statistically it, observed yeah. disparities. Right. Yeah. And uh, the claim about the source of those disparities was by even the standards of the time, but certainly the, the standards of today, an incredibly tepid, mealy-mouthed, just hand-waving. It was not this you know, here comes the Third Reich declaration of, of white supremacy. It was undoubtedly there are environmental and genetic reasons for this, and we don't understand them. You know, it was just, it was just like to, to think that it's one or the other, we're not in a position to know what the mix is of, of, of influences now. Um, and that is uh, virtually any honest scientist's take on the matter. 
Um, Whether it is intentional or not, Sam Harris displays here that he has been taken in by a logical fallacy. You see, the way Sam Harris thinks about this is, if intelligence is partially genetic, and the phenotypes we arbitrarily assign to so-called races are also genetic, then the IQ difference between the races has to be genetic as well, at least partially. This is a non sequitur, it does not follow. The biggest nullifier I could mention to highlight how genetics can be overestimated when it comes to intelligence is men and women. You see, the difference between men and women is pretty substantial. We're talking about an entire chromosome here. Yet, when it comes to a black man and a white man, or an Asian woman and a Caucasian woman, we're not talking about a chromosome. And if men and women can have almost the same average IQ, despite being separated by an entire chromosome, then a difference between so-called races, that's only 15% of the difference between individuals, could also then very well not be responsible for the difference in IQ between so-called races. After all, this is just basic genetics. Now, an example that I can bring up as actual evidence against the idea of the differences in IQ between races having to be due to genetics, at least partially, is the fact that in transracial adoption studies, we actually find that the entire difference can be explained by environment, not by genes. I mean, there was a time when being a few standard deviations above the mean in intelligence didn't get you very much when you're just plowing the field alongside your neighbors. But now you can start a software company or a hedge fund. Okay, and this leads to astonishing levels of wealth inequality and cultural isolation. This is a theme that Murray has returned to in his other work and in a more recent book, Coming Apart, which we also discuss. Now, unfortunately for Murray, what we have here is a set of nested taboos. Human intelligence itself is a taboo topic. People don't want to hear that intelligence is a real thing and that some people have more of it than others. They don't want to hear that IQ tests really measure it. They don't want to hear that differences in IQ matter because they're highly predictive of differential success in life. And not just for things like educational attainment and wealth, but for things like out of wedlock birth and mortality. People don't want to hear that a person's intelligence is in large measure due to his or her genes. And that there seems to be very little we can do environmentally to increase a person's intelligence, even in childhood. It's not that the environment doesn't matter, but genes appear to be 50 to 80% of the story. People don't want to hear this. And they certainly don't want to hear that average IQ differs across races and ethnic groups. Now, for better or worse, these are all facts. In fact, there is almost nothing in psychological science for which there is more evidence than these claims about IQ, about the validity of testing for it, about its importance in the real world, about its heritability, and about its differential expression in different populations. Again, this is what a dispassionate look at decades of research suggests. You see, Sam, most of the ideas regarding the heritability of IQ rest on two types of studies. Twin studies, which I've already covered in a previous video, again, link below, and genome-wide association studies. And one of those studies that's been cited a lot by genetic determinists, I've already covered in a previous video as well. Now, there's a bunch of problems with these types of studies that I can mention in this video, but I'm just going to mention one because what I'm about to mention alone is reason enough to doubt the validity that genetics has to be responsible for the difference in IQ between so-called races. And it's the fact that these types of studies, which is the bulk behind the proponents of this idea, due to their study design, lack predictive power. This is also known as the missing heritability problem. You see, these studies can be used to assign a certain level of heritability of different traits. But the problem is, when you actually go in and you find the specific genes that you think are responsible for this heritability, you find that they are in fact only marginally responsible for the total effect that you see. Now this convoluting factor in of itself casts a huge shadow on the validity of the idea that the racial IQ gap 
has to be because of genetics. Let's take body height as an example. According to genome-wide association studies, as well as twin studies, a correlation coefficient of almost 90% in some cases was established regarding body height. In other words, that body height was up to 90% heritable. However, when the 40 genetic variants were identified that were believed to be responsible, they could only account for somewhere between 3 to 5% of the actual heritability. Now, how can this possibly be? Well, you see, your environment decides a lot more than you think, even when it comes to simple traits like your height. Granted, if you have a genetic disorder that gives you dwarfism, you will not be tall, period. But if you have the genes to grow very tall, but you don't get enough food, which is an environmental factor, you're not going to grow to be tall regardless, which makes this a separate case different in its nature from dwarfism, for example. Unless we're talking actual genetic illnesses here, Sam, to put so much onto genes as an explaining factor for even more complex traits like intelligence is just buffoonery, to be honest. If something so simple as height can vary incredibly between people due to their environmental factors, despite the genetic components of height now being identified pretty well, intelligence is not a simple characteristic. It's a complex characteristic. And we already know from almost a hundred years of data, Sam, that IQ can't just be lowered by your environment, but also heightened. Like I've mentioned before, not only can correlations between IQ and how well you do in school be explained by other factors, but research even shows that IQ can and will be affected by how well you do in school and vice versa. Intelligence and schooling have a very clear bi-directional relationship and they do affect one another to a very good extent, probably more than we can ever quantify. The authors examine the evidence for linkages among three variables, schooling, intelligence, and income. They conclude that intelligence and schooling have a bi-directional relationship, with each variable influencing variations in the other. Moreover, changes in both schooling and intelligence influence variations in economic outcomes. Although any single study of the interdependency of these three variables can be criticized on the ground that the data are correlational and consequently are open to alternative interpretations, when viewed together, the evidence for their linked causality is quite convincing. Each increment in school attendance appears to convey significant increases not only in economic and social returns, but also in psychometric intelligence. Thus, the value of schooling appears to extend beyond simply schooling's direct effect on income. The earliest example of the influence of schooling on IQ scores was reported by Freeman in 1934. At the turn of the century, the London Board of Education commissioned Hugh Gordon to study a group of children who had very low IQs. Some of these children were found in London classrooms, whereas others attended school only intermittently, either because of their physical disabilities or because of their status as sons and daughters of gypsies, cannibal boat parents, and so forth. In Freeman's words, Further analysis revealed the impressive and startling fact that the intelligence quotients of children within the same family decreased from the youngest to the oldest. Not only that, but the youngest group, 4 to 6 years of age, had an average IQ of 90, whereas the oldest children, 12 to 22, had an average IQ of only 60, a distinctly subnormal level. The marked and steady decrease in intelligence with increasing age suggests that factors other than heredity are at work. The younger children appear to be about normal in intelligence because success in the tests of the earlier years does not depend upon the opportunity for mental stimulus and exercise such as is offered by the school. The results of the investigation suggest that without the opportunity for mental activity of the kind provided by the school, though not restricted to it, intellectual development will be seriously limited or aborted. Freeman's conclusion was bolstered by data from the children of gypsies, who also attended school intermittently. There was a high negative correlation between IQ and chronological age, as was the case for the physically handicapped youngsters. Note that this is in the opposite direction of the often reported fact that firstborn children possess higher IQs than their younger siblings. Thus, the longer youngsters stayed out of school, the lower were their IQs.
The next study of the influence of intermittent schooling on IQ was carried out in 1932 by Sherman and Key. They studied children near 100 miles west of Washington, D.C. in hollows that rimmed the Blue Ridge Mountains. Some of the hollows were more remote than others. The ancestors of these hollow children were Scottish, Irish, and English immigrants who retreated into remote regions of the mountains when their land was deeded to German immigrants in the 19th century. They remained in these hollows for several generations. Sherman and Key assumed that the original genetic pool of the people in the different hollows was very similar. They selected four of the hollows for study on the basis of their differing levels of isolation from modern communities. They also studied a fifth hollow, Briarsville, that had been settled by the same Scottish-Irish stock as the others, but was situated at the foot of the mountains rather than in an isolated area, and had schools in session nine months of the year. Thus, Briarsville represented a sort of baseline against which the effects of isolation associated with the more remote hollows could be evaluated. Call then the most remotely situated of the hollows had no movies or newspapers and virtually no access roads to the outside world. There was a single school, but it was in session intermittently. A total of only 60 months out of 127 months between 1918 and 1930, only three of Calvin's adults were literate, and physical contact with the outside world appears to have been non-existent. The other three hollows were progressively more modern. They had varying levels of contact with the outside world. Sherman and Key observed that the IQ scores of the hollow children fluctuated systematically with the level of schooling available in their hollows. Advantages of 10 to 30 points were found for the children who received the most schooling. Also, there was a dramatic age-related trend in IQ levels. The older the child, the lower was his or her IQ. Six-year-olds' IQs were not much below the national average, but by age 14, the children's IQ had plummeted into the mentally retarded range. In a later study from 1965, they reached a similar conclusion. They reported that the IQs of children born in 1940 in a mountainous area of Tennessee were, on average, 11 points higher than the IQs of their siblings born in 1930. A genetic explanation was rejected for this improvement in favor of one that emphasized the increased educational and economic opportunities that developed during the decade in question. Similar cumulative deficits in IQ with age have been reported among African Americans and British working class youths. A study from 1964 showed that the average difference between IQs of differing social classes became larger with age. All of these studies share a focus on the systematic changes in IQ scores with the amount of schooling that a child receives. All show that the average child started out with an IQ in the average range but became progressively lower in IQ as a function of the cumulative effects of intermittent schooling. Thus, studies of intermittent schooling provide evidence for a causal link between schooling and IQ. I think I'm done here. Just to make it clear, I didn't make this video because I dislike Sam, but the opposite. I like Sam, and what he's done for all who value open debate and free thinking. We owe a lot to Sam. However, since I do enjoy his work, it is my duty, I think, to call him out when he's dishonest. Whether it's intentional or not is irrelevant. The damage is done, regardless, to susceptible minds. With that, I thank you for watching.